Hey friends, welcome to Make Anything, it's Devin here. And I don't know how many of you are on 3D printing Twitter, but there's been a bit of a trend going on that's been dubbed spaghetti printing. It's the idea of printing with really fat layer heights using really large nozzles, often custom drilled out. Several great printers have shared their spaghetti prints and man, I love them. They look so clean and so nice. It's something that I played around with a few years back with my vase exploration series. And I also made this stepped bin using a two millimeter wide extrusion width. And it's actually super awesome. Not only does it look super cool, but these parts come out super sturdy. I've used this thing as my actual recycling bin for years now and it's still good as new. So that's awesome but today's project is only slightly related. I've always thought those thick layer lines just look so satisfying, and this week that led me to wonder if I could make the layers even bigger, like huge. And I did pull it off by cheating. <laughs> so here are this week's creations. And basically this is a technique I call printception because it's like I'm printing a print that looks like a bigger print. Prinception. I don't know. Name in progress. If you have any better names, let me know in the comments. But what I did here was I modeled vases to look like they've got super fat layer lines when in fact these were printed with really small layer lines. This little fella right here was printed with a 0.08 millimeter layer height. So it's super tiny, but that allowed me to get a nice smooth print that looks like it was printed with a seven millimeter nozzle. Not only that, but I printed out the actual hypothetical seven millimeter nozzle and made it look like it's in the process of printing this vase and just kind of floating in the air, defying gravity. So I printed out all these different vases and containers in different styles just to play around with this technique. And I also used all sorts of different filaments, lots of Matter Hackers Pro PLA, which I always like for its really vibrant colors and easy printability. And then for all these different nozzles, I actually used all kinds of different filaments to experiment with creating kind of metallic looking prints. So with this hexagon and this pentagon container, I printed the nozzles using Polyalchemy's Elixir PLA, which I've shown before, and it's just got this beautiful silky shine. They've got this dark gray one and a light gray that both came out looking really nice. It's not like a realistic metal, but it still looks metallic and really fun. Then there's this square dish, which I really like. It's a nice shallow container. And the nozzle on this one, well, it definitely doesn't look like metal, but I still wanted to try out this filament because this is a Greengate 3D PETG filament that is made in the US and it's 100% recycled plastic. So I was pretty keen to try that out and see how well a 100% recycled filament prints. And while it definitely had some inconsistencies with the thickness of the filament, and I did have to run it through the dehydrator to reduce the stringing, I did manage to get a really nice print here. So while it's a little bit more work to print with, the fact that it's 100% recycled is pretty appealing. I also just really love this light gray color, if you haven't noticed by my Make Anything branding. So yeah, that's Greengate 3D Recycled PETG. Next up, there's this really nice Vortex vase, which has this awesome twisted form that I love. And not only is the shape cool, but the nozzle here was printed with Protopasta's stainless steel filament, which has actual stainless steel within it. So it's got a really nice metallic look. It comes out really matte, but you can polish it as well, which we'll show a little later in the video. But even when it's raw like this, it's got a really nice look and it's got a really nice weight to it as well. So I'm a big fan of that stuff. You just need to make sure to use an abrasive resistant nozzle if you're gonna print something like this. I used my Olsen Ruby nozzle on the BQ 3D printer and it came out looking awesome. And then there's this little guy that we started out with, printed with this really awesome, vibrant, hot pink PLA from Matter Hackers. And I also used Matter Hackers Pro PLA for the nozzle with this regolith gray that I've showed you guys before. It's like a kind of translucent looking gray with some shimmery glitter in it as well. It's very subtle, but cool looking. So there we go. All kinds of really cool vases with cool materials. And what's more, today I'm gonna show you 
how I made these vases. So that means some of you are probably gonna leave the video right now, but if you do wanna learn a little bit of modeling in Fusion 360, this is gonna be a really awesome tutorial. As always, I'll try to be nice and thorough with my tutorial, but this is more of an intermediate project, so if you're brand new to modeling in Fusion 360, I might recommend my how to make anything tutorials first, but there's a lot of cool techniques that we're using in this tutorial, so you should definitely give it a look. We'll be making a non-cylindrical helix. We'll also be using some 3D sketching, so some stuff I haven't shown too much in my videos. If you're into it, stick around. It's gonna be fun. Let's go! Cool. All right, let's get started here in Fusion 360 with a fresh project. I'm gonna start by creating a sketch on our right plane. And I'll select a line, go from the origin straight upwards to create our center line for the revolve of our vase. We can hit D and select this line to give it a dimension. And this will be the height of our vase. I want this to be the largest vase of the bunch. So I'm gonna set this to 300 millimeters. Next up, I'll draw a horizontal line from the bottom of that line and another from the top of the line to set the top and bottom of our vase. And then I'm gonna make a fit point spline. So spline allows us to create a nice curvy profile, which always makes for a nice vase. And I got three points here, which we can drag around and we can pull these handles until we get a vase shape that we're happy with. Once it looks pretty good, we can finish the sketch and select the revolve tool, click on our profile. And for the axis, we'll select this center line. We'll hit OK, and now we've got a preview of our vase shape. After doing a revolve like this, oftentimes you want to make some changes, and that's perfectly fine. We can go right back into the sketch and make whatever adjustments we need to, and click Finish again, and Fusion will update that model. I'll actually go back in and make a few more adjustments. This is the base shape of our entire model, so we do want to make sure that we get it to something that we're happy with. All right, there we go. Now we have a nice, tall, narrow vase shape. I like this. So next up, I'm gonna hit the shell tool and select these top and bottom flat surfaces. And I'll set this shell to five millimeters inside, which basically just hollows out our shape here. Now we wanna create our spiral path that follows the shape of this vase. So let me select this top plane, and then I'm gonna go ahead and create a coil. Then I'll click the origin here and I'll go ahead and just eyeball the size of the coil. If we look from the bottom, we just wanna make sure that the coil is smaller than the smallest diameter of our vase. So it looks like we're good here. So we'll change the section to a square and we'll make the section size one millimeter. We'll change the coil type to a height and pitch coil so that we can set the pitch here because that's basically gonna be the layer height of the fake print we're simulating. I'm gonna set this to six. So we're gonna have these six millimeter thick layers in our spiral. For the height, we just wanna make sure that this coil passes through the entire profile from the side. So we can see it's popping out the top. But if we do look at the bottom here straight on, you'll notice that the coil does start kind of halfway through the bottom of this face. So I'm gonna hit M to select the move tool and take that coil and move it down just a tiny bit to make sure it's passing through the entirety of the height of our vase. Next, I'll click the push pull tool, and then I'm gonna select the face on the outside of this helix, and I'll pull that out to extend beyond the maximum width of our vase. There we go. We can look at it from the side and make sure that the entire vase is covered by this coil. So that looks good. Now we can use this combine tool, and we'll select our vase as the target body and the coil as our tool body. And we wanna make sure that we have this selected as a cut operation. So we're basically cutting that coil out of our vase here. And there we go. Now we've got this spirally vase and this might look familiar because it's very similar to the process of creating the springos that I've made. Also, I'm gonna save right now because from here on out, there are a lot of operations involving pretty complex surfaces and Fusion has crashed a lot while I've been making these, so we do wanna make sure to save often. Anyways, we've got our spirally vase here, and this is actually not the vase itself, but the template. We really created all of this just to get this helical path 
that runs along the entire form of the vase. So I'm gonna select that path and use the plane along path tool and make the distance one. So that goes to the very end of the path and I'll hit okay. And this basically creates this plane that's perpendicular to that spiral path right at that point on the end. Zooming in, you may notice that the other end of this spiral doesn't line up exactly with the plane and that's fine. Basically, we're just using the outside path. We'll click that plane we just created, start a new sketch, and we should get this little origin point right at the beginning of that path. We're gonna use that to create a center point circle. We'll give that a dimension of seven millimeters in diameter. That's gonna be our nozzle width, basically. And then I'm gonna create a line which runs from one side of the circle to the other. And you'll see we have this little horizontal constraint. If not, you can right click on the line and select horizontal right there. So that's locked horizontally. And we also wanna select this center point and then hit control and select the line and then make those coincident so that the line snaps to that center point. You can also select coincident from up here. There's multiple ways to do this, but basically we've created the circle path of our spiral and we split that circle in half so that we can do two separate sweeps. First, we're gonna sweep the top half of the circle and we're using the path and guide surface. Select the path being that outside coil and we'll set the distance to 0.01 for now so that when we select our guide surface, which is the surface of the spiral, it will not spend a whole long time computing. We'll switch this to a new body and then we can extend the distance all the way to one, which basically means sweep that half circle along the entire spiral up the base. This will probably halt Fusion 360 for a little bit as it computes this complicated sweep, but if we're lucky, we will have a successful sweep. If we go into our bodies here and turn off the template, you can see what we've got so far. And now we'll go to the drop down menu for our sketches and turn on that sketch we just used to sweep the top half of the circle. And we'll do the exact same thing with the bottom half of the circle. And we'll do another sweep using that same guide curve and the same guide surface. And the reason we have to do these two separate sweeps is if we selected the entire circle, the sweep would be self intersecting and we would get all kinds of errors. So by splitting this sweep up into the top and bottom half of the circle, we get two valid sweeps which we can afterwards combine into our single coil, which is exactly what we'll do right now. So let's turn on the top half again. And now you can see both of those together make this full tube spiral. We'll use the combine tool and select both the top and bottom parts. doesn't really matter which one's the target and which one's the tool. We'll let Fusion think that through once again. And once it's done, we can hit OK. And we have a single body with this entire spiral. We can make sure that this is all merged together by looking at the end caps here. As you see, we have a solid face and on the bottom here as well, if we turn off that sketch, it's that solid circle without the line running through it. So that means these were successfully combined into one big shape. Now that we've got our perfect coil, the next thing we want to do is create a bottom for this vase. And to do this, we basically need our coil to transition because right now it's spiraling downwards and we want that to transition into a flat base. In this case, you can see the coil ends just before meeting up with the right plane. So what I'm gonna do is select that right plane and start a sketch, and I'm gonna create another seven millimeter circle. And then I'm just gonna eyeball the position of that just a bit lower than where our coil ends. So we'll hit finish, and now you can see we've got the end of the coil and this new path we created. Now we can use the loft tool to select the end of our coil as one profile. And then for our second profile, we'll select this new circle. And we want that to be a new body for now. So that's a simple way to have the profile transition into this circle that's perpendicular to the right plane. And we can adjust it a bit to make it more smooth looking. That's pretty decent looking. So next up, I'll select this face of the short section we just created. And I'm gonna start a new sketch on there. First, I'll hit P to project this face. And then I'm gonna go ahead and create a line from that center point out to the left. 
That's going to be horizontally constrained, and then we're going to create a vertically constrained line that's coincident with the origin right here. Realize that the horizontal line is not passing through the origin of our model, since it is a little bit lower. Anyways, now we're going to go ahead and use this line and drop a bunch of center point circles along this line. These are going to make up the concentric rings of our base. So I'll use the equal constraint now to make sure all these circles are the same size as that 7 millimeter outer circle. And now I'll drag these so that they're all slightly overlapping. And it looks like we'll have room for one more here before the center point. And I'll make that one equal as well. There we go. Let's go ahead and make this horizontal line a construction line, which will make this next part a bit easier because we want to create these short little lines that go from the outside of one circle to the outside of the other circle in this short little area where they overlap, like so. And we're going to do that between each of these overlapping circles so that we can select these short lines and give them an equal constraint, which makes all these circles overlap by an equal amount. So there's two of them, and we'll keep doing that, working our way down. Then we'll go back and make sure all of those are equal. Now, Fusion still selects the construction line on accident sometimes. And what you can do is just click and hold down the mouse. And that'll give us this little drop down menu, which allows us to clarify which line we're trying to select. I'll do another line here, make that equal as well. And now for this last circle that's overlapping the center line, we want to create another short line from the outside of that circle to the center line. And when we revolve this, that circle is basically overlapping itself. So we only want that to be half the distance of all these other lines. So I'll create this little line going from the center point here to the outside of one of these circles, and I'll make that equal to this line. With that, all these circles should now be totally constrained. We won't be able to drag them around because they're all defined by all these different constraints we put into place. So now we can go ahead and select our revolve tool and we'll select all of these circular profiles on the right side of our axis. And then we'll select the axis, which is that center point passing through the origin. And we can select join here to have it fuse with that little bit we created earlier, the transition from the spiral to this flat part. And now if we turn on the rest of that spiral, we'll see that it kind of transitions into this flat bottom circle. Although it is looking kind of clunky. So let's go back to that loft. And from these little drop downs, we'll change the property to direction instead of connected, which makes for a smoother transition. And we might want to change the weight so that it's not so drastic. And it's still kind of lumpy. So I think we have to go back to that profile we created and we're going to move it a little bit to try to make it look smoother and we're kind of just eyeballing it still but the cool thing now is that when we finish that all the other work we did with the overlapping circles will automatically update because all of those positions are based on constraints so it's automatically updated and now this looks like a much smoother transition though there is this weird part at the bottom which we don't want so let's go back to that loft and let's just try changing the takeoff weight of both of these profiles back to one, like so. Now if we hit OK, you'll see that it looks much cleaner and that's a pretty nice transition. So from this point, we can select the combine tool again and we'll join our big vase spiral to the bottom portion, and make this all into one body once again. All right, we've definitely got a vase now, but the bottom of this thing is all rounded, so it's not going to be easy to print. Let's fix that by first creating a section analysis on the right plane, so we have a better image of what's going on down here. And then we'll start a sketch on the right plane. So what we want to do here is just slice off some of the bottom so that we have a more printable model. And to do that, I'll start by projecting the center point of one of these circles. So we'll do this outer one. And then I'll use that to create a center point circle. Make that seven millimeters once again. And that should line up perfectly with the model we have so far. We can turn off the other sketches. Now we just want to create this big rectangle. This is going to be this section that we cut away from our vase. 
So if we turn it on here, you can see it's just cutting off a section of these circles. We'll use the line tool and start off from this circle. And if we hold shift, it'll make sure that the line comes off at a tangent from that circle. We'll create this little line coming out at an angle. And then we'll use the dimension tool from that line to this rectangle line and make that 45 degrees. Now we'll select the point of that line where it meets the circle, hold down control and select this rectangle line and make those coincident, which snaps the rectangle into place so that basically we'll be cutting off anything that's steeper than 45 degrees. We'll finish that sketch and now we'll do an extrude cut with this big rectangle. We'll make it symmetric, we'll make it a cut, and we'll just have it large enough so that it passes through the entire bottom of our vase. Now if we hit OK, you'll see that we've flattened the bottom of our vase. It still does have these concentric circles, which gives us the look of a giant 3D printed part, but it also has this nice flat surface that should print relatively easily without any supports. Speaking of which, you might notice that the spiral here does seem to have some overhangs that are far greater than 45 degrees, which is usually the safe angle for overhanging parts. But what's interesting is that with spiraling parts like this vase, you can get away with a lot steeper of an overhang just because of the way that it's spiraling around. So it's not printing the entire overhang all at once, but rather the overhang kind of travels around the circle as the print goes on. So that's kind of what I'm simulating here with the section analysis. You can imagine these being layers of the print. And as you see, there's kind of that blob that revolves around, but there's no sudden overhangs that would cause this print to drastically fail. Anyways, there we go. We've cut off the bottom. We've got our spiral. We've got most of the vase done. But the last thing we want to do is have this kind of sweeping noodle coming out from the top here. So I'm going to go ahead and select this face. I'm going to sketch on it and I'm going to hit P and project that face, which gives us these two points so that we can create a line from one to the other. And that allows us to find the center point of this circle. And by the way, I've been using the shortcut C to get this tool, but I set that myself. With all these tools, there's this little drop down and you can set custom keyboard shortcuts, which is definitely handy. Anyways, let's create our center diameter circle from that center point out to one of these side points. So that gives us the profile of our entire circle once again. We'll finish that sketch and we're going to start another sketch on the same profile. Only this time we're going to flip this little box here to turn this into a 3D sketch. So it's no longer constrained to that right plane. What we're going to do here is first create two little lines from the center point of this circle. One straight out to the side like so and another straight up to the top, like so. Now we'll use the spline tool and create a third line starting from that center point. And this is where we start taking advantage of that 3D sketch. So for the second point, I'm gonna kind of angle this until we can snap to this blue line. You'll see that blue dotted line pop up and the spline point kind of snaps onto place. So we'll click a point there now we'll go up and snap one to this Y axis. Then we'll add another point snapping again to this blue axis and maybe one more. And that just gives us several control points to our spline so that we can now move it around and create the actual noodle that we want. The first thing we need to do though is make sure that this spline is tangent to this top of the coil so that it looks like it's coming out smoothly. And we can't just drag the spline points since we're in a 3D sketch. But if you hit M, you can use the move tool to move the points. So we'll drag that handle around so that things look relatively tangent. But to really make it perfect, we can select the handle, hit control and select this little line. Then we'll right click and give those a perpendicular constraint. And we'll also create a perpendicular constraint between this vertical line and our handle. So now with the handle constrained to both of those lines, our spline is guaranteed to always come out of that point tangent to that circular profile. So now we can use the move tool again to move around these other points. But as you'll see, the line always comes out smoothly from our sketch over here. 
So now I'm just gonna play around with the move tool and move around each of these individual points from my spline to try to get the nice organic noodly line that I'm trying to get. And when you're working in a 3D sketch like this, it's important that you are constantly moving around your camera angle and looking at this line from all sorts of different perspectives because it can be kind of misleading to work on a 3D object with a 2D screen like most computers have. But as long as we keep moving around, we can get a good sense of how this line is curving around. And remember, you can move the spline points as well as the handles using that move tool. So from the top, you can see I'm still having the curves of this noodle kind of follow the circle of our vase. And then from the side views, we just wanna make sure that none of these sweeps are too steep because we do want this to print without support material. There we go. Just kind of making the curves as gentle as they need to be while still getting a nice crazy curvy look that I want. Once I'm pretty happy with the line, I'll go ahead and save just to be sure. And we'll actually turn off this big spiral just to reduce the risk of crashing my computer. And we'll just create a new sweep, selecting that circle face and having the single path be this new spline we created. And it looks like we're getting an error here. And if we zoom in, we can see that it thinks that this sideline is part of the path. So let's go back into that sketch. We'll just right click on it on the timeline down here, edit sketch, and we'll change these lines into construction lines by hitting X. After all, they are construction lines. There we go. Now when we do our sweep, it should not try to include those little lines in our path. There we go. That looks good. Let's hit OK to create this new body. And on the top of the noodle here, I'm gonna use the extrude tool and just extrude this face straight out for six millimeters or so, just so that there's a, a straight part for the nozzle to stick onto. I'm also gonna give this a little two millimeter fillet because I think that looks nice. All right, there we've got the end piece. So now let's go ahead and turn on the other body again. And for a final time, we'll use the combine tool to join our vase with this new part. There we go. It looks pretty good, although I am noticing it kind of dipping down before it curves up. So we can go back into that sketch and make any adjustments we need to. And Fusion 360 should automatically update all the work we've done. There we go. That looks a little smoother. And there's still a few small changes I want to do, which is no problem at all. We'll go right back into that sketch drag around the handles however we need, and let Fusion update when we're finished with that sketch. Okay, now I am totally happy with how this vase looks. That piece coming off the top looks really nice and natural. We can hit A to open up the appearance menu and change the color of this model if we wanna preview what it will look like with different filaments. I'm printing this in a nice vibrant yellow color. We'll do a final inspection, make sure the bottom's flat. Everything on the top looks good. All right, this truly looks great now. So let's go ahead and right click on the body in our drop-down tree here, and we'll select Save as STL. As you likely know, STL files are created from small triangles. So to create curved shapes like this vase, it takes a whole lot of triangles. But that's totally all right. Let's just hit OK, save that out, and we can bring it into our slicer to print. So let's take a quick look at it in our slicer. I'm using Simplify 3D, but Cura, slicer, anything should work. It's a pretty simple file. It doesn't require any supports. And oh boy, take a look at that. This thing is just hitting the maximum height of my Sidewinder printer here. So this is a pretty ideal giant model. But yeah, everything fits inside. And as far as slicer settings, we really don't have to do too much special, but we are gonna make sure that we have a nice small layer height. So I'm using a 0.12 millimeter layer height here. And basically the lower the layer height, the steeper the overhangs that you can pull off successfully tend to be. And with this model, that's mostly important just for this very end part where that noodle curves upwards. And the small layer height will certainly help us pull that off. Another good way to check your overhangs is to create a layer preview, and then you can just look at the layer from underneath. Here you can see that we do indeed have overhang, but it's nothing too significant. 
we can't see the infill or anything, so this should definitely print just fine. Although the build time here is really long, it's at 51 hours, so I'm gonna go ahead and increase the layer height to 0.16 and see what that does to these overhangs. Now when we preview it once again and look at this overhanging part, you can see that there's a bit more exposed, that light green is the infill, but it's still just little tiny sections so that I think it will still print quite nicely. At least nice enough to justify saving 10 hours off of the print time. Let's do one last pass looking through each of these layers really quickly. As you can see, we've got this mostly hollow with a 7 to 10% infill. That's really all we need. It's a rather simple part. And yeah, looks good. Let's send it to the printer. Here it is, our beautiful vase, just as we designed it in Fusion 360, printing out in Matterhacker's Yellow Pro PLA on the Artillery Sidewinder X1 3D printer. The model prints with no problem. It's just this little curve at the end that's probably the toughest part, or at least the steepest, but as you can see, it's handled quite well here, and this noodle looks pretty clean. Here it is, fresh off the build plate. A beautiful print. Look at this thing, it's a nice big old vase. This one came out looking so cool. Uh, maybe it's just the size, but this is one of the most impressive out of the bunch, I'll say. It kinda looks like a big old cartoon beehive or something. I'm tempted to make a little bee that's sticking out of it instead of a nozzle. <laughs> but I did print out the nozzle, and uh, this is another one printed with that Protopasta stainless steel PLA. And this time around, I did give it a little bit of a quick polish. You can actually run this through a polishing machine and make it really nice and shiny and super metallic looking. But I went the quick and dirty route and just used a wire brush to burnish this print. And that already gave it quite a nice finish. If you look at it next to the unfinished piece, you can see the difference. It's still nice and matte, but it looks a little bit more metallic. Anyways, we can just stick that right on top of our vase, and we've got another awesome printception. So hopefully some of you will follow that tutorial and make these awesome vases for yourself, because it's really fun to come up with your own design and super satisfying to print it out. Now, making the vase itself was enough work for this tutorial, so I didn't run through the making of this little nozzle right here, but I will have all these files available for you to download on My Mini Factory. So, if you make a vase yourself, you should be able to print out my nozzle and stick it on top of your vase. If you are interested in the process of designing this nozzle, I actually did make a little bonus video that I'm going to share on Patreon. And speaking of which, Patreon just announced the ability to buy an annual membership. So, if you really love what I'm doing here on this channel and you haven't joined me on Patreon yet, go ahead and visit patreon.com slash makeanything and you can get access to that bonus video with the nozzle, a few videos every now and then, uh, as well as access to the Make Anything Discord group where you can uh, share your prints, see what I'm working on, all kinds of fun stuff like that. All right, that was quite the video. I don't think I've done one that long in a real long time. Still, if you have any extra thoughts or questions, don't hesitate to leave a comment. As always, I'll put links in the video description in case you want to download some of these files or buy any of the filaments or anything that I mentioned in this video. And you might see more of these vases next week. I think I'm going to do a video on how I photograph my models because presentation is almost as important as making a nice model. Anyways, that's it for this week. So until next time, I'm Devin. This is Make Anything. And as always, Stay inspired.